Now, I don't know if any of you are golfers, but I can't think of a more difficult sport. <laughs> I've tried playing golf on a couple of occasions with experienced golfers, one time even with a golf pro. And you know, every piece of advice they gave me seemed to require me to do something that felt counterintuitive. You know what I mean? It felt wrong. I mean, they talk about the how to hold the club, the grip, and the swing, and um, the, uh, the stance, and, and all that just felt like it was unnatural, like it was going against my natural inclinations. I mean, it's, it's a good thing that you play in such a beautiful, peaceful setting, right? Because it is a completely maddening activity. Now, following Jesus is not really like, like golf, but it's, it's similar in, in one way, in that it requires that we go against our natural inclinations. I mean, even the most well-intentioned disciples tend to make certain mistakes. We think that we're serving Christ well sometimes, but we can do so in ways that actually undermine the mission He's given us. And I, th I think that starts on, on a very personal, individual level, but those kinds of problems, those kinds of mistakes can end up misleading groups, churches, organizations, even entire denominations. Uh, in His perfect wisdom, I mean, Jesus knows us, right? I mean, He knows the mistakes that we're going to make as, as His followers, as disciples, and so he, I think He prepares His disciples for that. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke each document instructions that Jesus gave uh, to the 12 apostles as he sends them out on, on a ministry uh, trip to the villages around Galilee. And we already talked about that. Uh, we saw it, uh, we looked at it in the first verses of Luke chapter 9. It talks about it there. But Luke describes another occasion when Jesus sends out a larger group of disciples. Uh, probably to villages around the Judea area, around Jerusalem, in the last few months before his crucifixion. So that's what we're looking at today. It's Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 16. And I think it, 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 it tells us how he prepares his disciples to overcome three of these common mistakes that disciples make. Now, I, I think this passage helps us in two major ways. First of all, it reminds us, by looking at it this way as, as mistakes, it reminds us that the various expressions of Christianity that we see in the world today may not line up with what Jesus intended. Right? And so um, it's, it's, you know, people, we need to remind people, and, and if, if you're not sure about Jesus, if you're at that place in your life, you you need to know that his followers get it wrong sometimes. And so make sure that you evaluate Christianity based on what Jesus intended it to be, not the, by the mistakes that Christians make. Uh, the second uh, way that this passage helps us is that if you're a disciple, then it, it presents a good opportunity for us to examine our hearts. Right? Because these mistakes are so common that we can become blind to them. And we need to make sure that we don't fall into the mindset of thinking, well, that's just the way it is. Uh, if, we're, if we're falling into these patterns, then we need to, re to repent of them. We need to strive to live according to Christ's teaching, even if it seems to go against what most of the Christians around us are doing. The first mistake uh, that disciples make that comes out in the passage is the mistake of individualism. You know, fall corn mazes are a really big business across the United States. And, um, but I was wondering this week, why is it always corn, right? Why not something else? Why not, why not a, a, a wheat maze? Why not an alfalfa maze, right? Why? Because they're too short, right? If, if, if you were in a, something like that, you could see the whole maze. It wouldn't be a challenge. You could just step from one aisle to the other. It, it wouldn't be a big deal. But corn stalks are tall, so you can't see. Right? They block your view. I mean, even when you have a picture of the, of the whole field from above, you still get disoriented when you're wandering through one of those things. I mean, you know, you hear voices a few rows over. But you can feel isolated. You can feel alone. I mean, some people begin to panic in, in those mazes. Well, I think the same kind of 
scenario happens sometimes when we're following Jesus. We lose sight of the big picture. We begin to feel alone. We only see what's right in front of us. And so what happens? Some believers convince themselves that they have to bear the burden of a church or some ministry alone. Right? It's that kind of strong, rugged individualism that, that we as Americans are so prone to, that I'm just going to tough it out in my strength. The other way that individualism comes out, I think, is some people look at the church and they get so disappointed by what they see in other Christians that they just withdraw from those relationships. And they treat their faith as something that's entirely personal. I see both both scenarios are examples of individualism in action. And like I say, I, I think it's, it's a mistake. Well, here in, in the first few verses of this passage, Luke 10, 1 and 2, Jesus counters that individualistic tendency. Take a look. It says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. See, Jesus, Jesus wants them to see that the work is far too big for any one person to handle. Right? Even, even there, the immediate goal what he was doing with this group, right? He wants them to go ahead of him into every village and place where he's going. They're, they're going to announce that he's coming. And maybe that's why he appoints 72 of them. I mean, some manuscripts say 70, so your Bible may say 70 or 72. But uh, they go out in pairs. So maybe there were 35 places, right? Or 36. Maybe there were more. We don't know for sure. Uh, but the harvest, you know, when he moves into verse 2 and he talks about the harvest... He's referring to something much bigger. Right? He's, he's saying that 72 people will not be enough. In fact, a, a lot of commentators in looking at this passage think the number may indicate something more about the scope of the work. Some people think that Jesus chooses that number to correspond with the 70 elders of Israel that, that Moses chose back in Numbers 11. Others think that he may even base it all the way back on the table of nations in Genesis 10, that it's, it's, it's designed to reflect all the nations of the world. Now, those are interesting connections. We can't prove any of those. They're just speculation. But I think we can say for certain that this work of the harvest is designed to move throughout Israel and then throughout the entire world. We know from Scripture that that's the scope, that's the direction of what was happening here. Now, when you think about it, it would seem more efficient to send them out individually, right, rather than in pairs. Why does Jesus do that? I mean, he doesn't explain, uh, but I think there's other biblical teaching that suggests some good reasons. So there, there are three of them that, that come to mind for me. First, uh, the Old Testament law uh, requires the testimony of two witnesses in a, in a courtroom setting, in a legal proceeding. And so that's, that's not exactly what's happening here. This is not... Not quite a legal situation, but having two voices still gives them a sense of greater credibility. Um, another reason here might be that going out in pairs establishes a system of accountability and encouragement. Think about it. They're going out, they're staying in people's homes, they could face various temptations. They don't know what they'll encounter. There could be a temptation of drunkenness or fighting or sexual immorality, stealing. There could be all sorts of things. Right? These are people. Uh, but Jesus uh, instructs his disciples elsewhere to deal with one another on those kinds of issues, to, to deal with one another one-on-one. -on -one. Matthew 18, verse 15, he says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Right? There was this, between believers, there was supposed to be this sense of, of personal accountability. And when we look elsewhere in the scripture, the pattern for the church, that continues that sense of involvement with each other and personal concern. And so, for instance, in, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, it says, But exhort one another every day, 
as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. See, this just reminds us that the Christian life cannot be lived alone. It's not just a personal, a personal thing because an individual on, as individuals on our own, we can't handle temptation well. We need other people who know us, other people who are willing to look out for us, right? And to say those hard words when we're doing something stupid. But that doesn't happen unless we're willing to, to play that same role in their life, right? It's, it's a mutual involvement. That connection with one another. There's one more reason I think that Jesus may have sent out the disciples in pairs, and it's that it establishes a, a training system. Think about it. A mature, experienced disciple can work alongside uh, someone who's just beginning to learn. Paul demonstrates that strategy as he fulfills Christ's mission, and he trains younger men like Timothy. And then in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, he even instructs Timothy to follow that same pattern. He says, And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Right? So individualism kills that process from happening. Right? It prevents that kind of handoff that's supposed to be there. Individualism is, is just concerned about the moment. It doesn't think about the future. And so we all need to be pursuing those kinds of relationships right, with people who are farther along in their faith uh, and people who are just beginning, people who need to grow. Now, bear in mind that the goal of these relationships, um, getting back to our passage, is not merely friendship. Right? It's not self-improvement. It's, it's all about the harvest, right? That's the work. That's the focus. And so how does Jesus call us to, to approach that? First, he, he talks about praying. Asking God to send out more laborers, right? That prayer is driven by the responsibility of the mission. And then, like the 72 disciples here, we tell people about Jesus. Jesus. Right? And in, in their case, they announced that he was going to come to their village. In our case, it's, it's announcing that Christ is going to return one day to rule. Right? In both cases, it's, the, it's calling people to prepare, to get ready for that. And so we spread that word throughout our community, throughout the world. And as God enables people to respond in faith, the idea here is that we then draw them into the work of the harvest. You get that? You see that, that the people responding, that's the answer to the prayer for more laborers. It's not just a prayer for, for converts. It's not just a prayer for people who would, who would listen. It's a prayer for people who would work. It's all kind of driven by that mission, that focus. So, don't make the mistake of individualism. Right? Don't, don't withdraw, don't have that go-it-alone mindset. When you follow Jesus, you're a part of this massive work, this worldwide harvest, and it's all about people. We have to be engaged with one another right? and with people out in the world. There's another mistake that comes out as Jesus continues here, and it's the mistake of antagonism. Now, when you think of aggressive animals, sheep are probably not at the top of your list, right? I mean, we think of wolves, we think of lions, we think of bears, but not sheep. But there are occasions when sheep can get violent, right? There are occasions when a ram will get hostile and charge at someone. I saw this video of some poor shepherd crossing a road with a sheep, and one of them headbutts him. Right? And knocks him down. And then the sheep keeps doing it. Pummeling the, the poor guy to the ground. Right? It's, kind of, it's kind of shocking. Because it's so out of our expectations of what we, we, the way we think of sheep. Now the Bible refers to you and I as sheep. Right? 
And we're supposed to be characterized by this sense of, of peace that comes from trusting and following the good shepherd. But sometimes we're like that ram in the video. Sometimes we're more inclined to be aggressive. Even as we try to, to represent Jesus, the, the Lamb of God, right? It's, it's kind of ironic because we want to represent him with this sense of, of power and this sense of, of sometimes even superiority. And so we can, be, we, we can be trying to represent Jesus and yet being pushy uh, and being, uh, you know, kind of arguing people into submission, uh, you know, declaring their sin and threatening them with judgment. I mean, that, that kind of antagonism is a serious mistake. And so Jesus instructs the disciples here to relate to people in a very different way. Take a look at Luke 10, verses 3 through 9. It tells us that he says, Go your way. Behold, I'm sending you out, here it is, as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So Jesus wants the disciples to approach their mission from a mindset, from a posture of humility. He knows full well that they're going to encounter wolf-like hostility from some people. He talks about that. But he instructs them uh, to conduct themselves like gentle lambs. Even if they have uh, wealth and possessions, he, want the, he wants them to leave behind those things. Right? He doesn't want them to be dependent upon that kind of, of power or control. Now, to be clear, he's not calling them to a life of poverty, um, but he wants them to carry out their mission with this sense of complete humility and dependence. And so he even tells them not to greet people on the road, right? The idea is because they're functioning as his servants. They're representing him. They're on a mission. And so this humble conduct it's essential because it's designed to reflect their message. And I think that's what he's getting at here when he talks about peace. Now, some people say that uh, when, he's, when it says there, peace be to this house, that it's just like a, a greeting uh, or some kind of blessing. But, but I, think, I think it's more than just some meaningless phrase. Right? Because he makes a big deal about how people respond to that. Uh, some people respond, well, they're a son of peace. And then that peace, he says, rests upon them. It stays with them. Those who don't respond to it, uh, then it doesn't benefit them. It, it kind of goes back. It's taken away. And so I think what Jesus is describing here is the offer of salvation. See, they're supposed to proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near, right? Right? And peace is an integral part of that kingdom. I mean, we know, looking back in Scripture, that you know, since Adam and Eve uh, first sinned, humanity has been in this state of perpetual conflict with God and, and with one another. But the coming Messiah is supposed to fix all of that. It's supposed to bring a full and complete re uh, reconciliation that transforms society. Uh, the prophet Isaiah talks about that. Right? We often read these verses at Christmas time. But think of it in connection here. He says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Then he says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. 
So the, the coming of the kingdom is all about peace. And so then later, after Jesus ascends into heaven, the apostles continue to proclaim the, the good news, the gospel of peace. But they begin to focus on the individual uh, aspects of that. I mean, every sin that we commit is, is an act of, of hostility toward God. It's an act of rebellion. And so there's a sense where uh, of that personal separation, that personal division that we have between us and God. And so in Romans 5.1, Paul says this. He says, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he explains that further down in verse 10. He says, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And so peace has to do with the coming of Messiah and then the transformation that will happen throughout the world. It has to do with us in our personal standing before God. But then it also comes into play then when we have that relationship with God, that we can experience that as we encounter trials in life. Paul talks about that in, in Philippians 4. He, he puts it this way. He says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then he says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So see, when, when the disciples go out and say, peace be on this house, I think there's a sense where all of that full understanding of what God is doing is all kind of wrapped up in that. The wish of peace. It's the message of peace. And so, if that's what we preach, if that's what we declare, that peace with God and shouldn't we reflect that in how we behave and how we act? And so I think maybe that's why he tells them, right, when people set food before them, don't be grumpy, don't be picky, right? Just accept it. Some commentators even tell us that a lot of these villages they were going through may have had uh, Gentiles there who didn't follow the Jewish dietary law. And so he may even be suggesting, pointing to that, that they just need to respond in, in, with a sense of, of accepting and with humility. He doesn't want them to move around, right? To shop around for the best house to stay at. They're just supposed to accept it. And then he even enables them, again, to, to heal people. Right? As an expression, again, of this nearness of the kingdom and the peace that it gives. We talked about that uh, back in chapter 9 when, we, when he sent out the apostles. So, as disciples of, of Jesus, we should act like sons and daughters of peace. Right? That, that characteristic, that, that, should just, that should be a part of our lives. It should be evident in how we speak and in what we do. So think for a moment. Is, is that what people see in you? Is that what they hear from you? Do they look at you and say, well, that's a son or daughter of peace? The world's full of wolves, right? but he sends us out as gentle lambs. We can't respond with antagonism. The third mistake that I see here in this passage is pluralism. You know, a lot of big cities have really complicated freeway systems. And especially when multiple highways intersect. I used to drive through an interchange like this uh, pretty often in Los Angeles. And, and there can be, you know, as you, as you come up to the interchange, there can be a dozen different options to choose from. Right? It's, oh, it can be overwhelming, especially when you're driving along fast or in heavy traffic. But the thing is, in a big city like that, there's really no wrong choice. Because there's so many freeways and so many interchanges, it may delay you a little bit, but there's probably another interchange down the road that you can redirect and get back on path to where you want to go, right? Now, I think a lot of people 
are inclined to view religion that way. Uh, what I mean is they say that uh, with all the, the religions of the world, they say, well, we all believe in the same God, that people take different paths, but they eventually get to God as long as they're all sincere. And they, you know, after all, aren't, don't we preach a message of peace? Right? Even a few weeks ago, we talked about Jesus and the whole idea of acceptance. And so there have been even very prominent Christians throughout history who have expressed that kind of sentiment. Right? Even uh, C.S. Lewis, you know, in, in his book, The Last Battle, it's the final book in the Chronicles of Narnia series, he talks about a young man who spends his life worshiping another god instead of Aslan. Of course, Aslan is Lewis's figure of Christ. But Aslan uh, comes to the man and says that even though he worshipped this other god, he did it in a right heart, uh, with a sincere desire for the truth, and so Aslan welcomes him into his heavenly kingdom anyway. Right? I'm calling that the mistake of pluralism. And, what, and people define that term in a variety of ways. I'm using it in a very generic sense to refer to any view that allows for people to enter eternal life apart from explicit faith in Jesus Christ and his gospel prior to death. It's, it's the idea, you hear it at countless funerals, right? Or they'll say, well, well, well Joe here, he wasn't, a, he wasn't a religious man, but he was nice to a few people, right? And so we know he's going to be in heaven. Right? We hear that all the time. And a lot of Christians go along with that way of thinking. Because, again, Jesus is so loving and accepting. But it's wrong. Pluralism, that mindset, it undermines the gospel and it contradicts the explicit teaching of Jesus. And we see that here in this passage. Luke 10, 10 through 16 tells us how Jesus prepares his disciples to overcome this mistake. Take a look. He says, but whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. And Jesus says, I tell you, it'll be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. He says, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. The one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Now, these verses contain several important ideas, um, but I think they can get lost as we kind of wrestle with all the place names there. So, so let's set those aside for a moment and just draw out the ideas here. I think if we sum it up, we see, first of all, that Jesus teaches that a day of judgment is coming. And he says that every person who has ever lived will participate in that. Those who listen to the message of Jesus' disciples and receive it will be exalted to heaven. Those who reject the disciples, he says they're rejecting him and his heavenly Father. And so they'll be brought down to Hades. They'll be excluded from heaven. Furthermore, he even says that there will be degrees of, of anguish in Hades based in part upon the opportunities people had to respond to Jesus. Opportunities that they ignored during their lives. So now, what is it with all these places? Well, well Jesus is drawing upon different historical situations and comparing them to the present to drive home this comparison for them. And so he mentions Sodom, right? God destroyed the city of Sodom during the days of Abraham after the men of town tried to rape God's angelic messengers who came there. It's in Genesis chapter 19. And so Jesus says, this is a stunning comparison, he says that the eternal punishment for the villagers who reject his disciples will be worse than it will be for the men of Sodom. 
Right? Wow. And then he, he talks about Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon, they were cities uh, north of Israel, and they were known for their idolatry, right? Because that was, uh, Sidon was the hometown of Jezebel, right? Who married uh, Israel's king Ahab. She's the one who, who killed the prophets, who, who pursued Elijah. And so Jesus says, the people of Tyre and Sidon, if they had seen all the miracles that Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum had seen, those idolatrous people would have repented. They would have turned back. And so Jesus says that the punishment for Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, the places where he had been personally, it's going to be worse for them than it was for Tyre and Sidon. So what does Jesus want his disciples to do with that understanding of judgment? I mean, as we said, they bring a message of peace, right? In a peaceful way, with a peaceful demeanor. But when people reject that, reject them and reject that message, then what Jesus is saying is that they have to explain the consequences. Right? This whole wiping the dust off their feet thing, we, we've said it before, it's not, a, it's not a condescending act of hatred, it's not out of bitterness, it's, it's like evidence that these people had the opportunity to hear the gospel and they rejected it. It's a very somber warning. This is, there's, there's an air of sadness here. When Jesus uses the word woe, right, he's expressing a sense of grief that these cities have been so stubborn that they had the opportunity and they wouldn't take it. So the reality of this judgment, it should compel every disciple to present the gospel clearly. Right? And here's where we get back to that idea of pluralism, because it would be much easier and less controversial to give into that pluralistic impulse and say, well, everyone goes to heaven. Say, well, the gospel of Jesus, that's not for you. Okay, I understand. Right? To each his own. Because that's the spirit of our age, right? But the New Testament goes against that. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then Acts 4, 12 tells us that Peter uh, is preaching and he says there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. See, pluralism may seem gracious. It may seem a, a nice thing to say. But it's not. It's, it's, it, it denies people's need for salvation in Jesus Christ. That's the problem. It says that it doesn't really matter. And so Jesus tells his disciples, eternity's at stake. Right? Eternity's at stake. Care for people. And so that's, that's the whole point of this, uh, is that people need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we give in to individualism, we just ignore them and do our own thing, Right? Or we, even we, we may even try to reach out, but we don't do it in a way that trains up others for the future. We just kind of do our own little thing. Antagonism tries to force people to respond. And that's not right. That's not what Jesus calls us to do. Pluralism excuses their rejection and then denies the reality of judgment. So faithful disciples have to reflect both the compassion of Jesus and the clarity of Jesus about salvation, about what's required, and about the consequences. So, have you received God's peace? I mean, have you come to believe that Jesus really is the way and the truth and the life? Are you trusting in Him to save you? 
If not, if you haven't reached that point, I invite you to begin to believe in Him and to, to follow Him today. If you want to learn more about that message of salvation we, we read from Romans chapter 5, that's a great place to read in the New Testament where it talks about peace with God and, and the reality of our sin and, and how Jesus overcomes all of that. I encourage you to set aside some time to read it and to reflect upon it. And if you are following Jesus, then this passage challenges us about whether we're sharing that peace, whether it's, it shapes the way we relate to people. We shouldn't be known as argumentative people. We shouldn't be known as the people who are always trying to pick a fight or complain or grumble. That doesn't, that doesn't reflect the gospel. We need to, maybe there's one of these mistakes that you need to, to focus on avoiding personally. Or maybe there's someone uh, that comes to mind this morning that you think, I need to talk to that person about this peace of Christ. If that's the case, don't hesitate. Speak the truth and love. Reach out. My prayer is that the peace of Christ would fill our lives and, and overflow from us.